welcome to Resurgence Church. We are so excited that you found us and that you are able to join with us for the preaching of the Word today. If this is your first time with us, uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about us, if you want to request prayer, if you want to listen to past messages or just see what's going on at the church, you can do all of those things on our website, rsgchurch.com. You can also link to our Facebook page and our YouTube channel there. So if you want to support what we're doing, I would ask you to like and subscribe and share there. Uh, again, just thank you for joining us. We pray that this message is a blessing to you and builds your faith all to the glory of God. God bless. Uh, this morning, we are finishing up in chapter 9. If you remember, Carl spoke last week. Before that, we spent two weeks, actually, on the bulk of chapter 9 in John, and I saved like just a few verses right at the end of chapter 9. So that's what we're going to get into today. I'm actually going to backtrack just three or four verses just to give us that little bit of context, but stand with me if you would. We're looking at John chapter 9, verses 35 to 41. Actually, only uh, from verse... 39 on is the new stuff, but like I said, for a little bit of context, so you can read it with me if you will. It says this, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. You can grab a seat. And let's pray. Father, you are good and your word is is perfect and it endures and it applies in every situation. I pray, Lord, that we would receive the blessing of your word this morning, that it would build up your saints, Lord, that if there are any who have not confessed the name of Jesus Christ, that their hearts would be pricked today, that they would be cut to the quick, that they would uh, cry out, even as the Philippian jailer, what must we do to be saved, that, Lord, they would see the necessity of it, that you would awaken their their hearts, and make the blind to see. Help me get out of the way, Lord, that your word would go forth unadulterated, Lord, un, unhindered by any of my human frailty. I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so uh, excited. I, I love these last few verses. I've been very excited to, to preach on these and share this portion of Scripture with you, you know, and... Um, I, it, it kind of, there's so much in there. I was kind of going all over the place with it, honestly. I was so excited about it, and then I felt like I don't know exactly how to get it all in there. So I just kind of threw together some questions, you know, that, that uh, popped up as I was reading through this scripture. I said, okay, here's four questions that I kind of have for the text as we're going through. And I thought, rather than just going in 10 different directions at once, this would kind of be a guiding set of questions for us. So, uh, Ella, I've got those four questions up there, but, and I didn't even phrase them very cleverly. I apologize. I was going to be like, what's Jesus's beef? You know, but I at least, I at least refrained from that. Like, what's Jesus's problem with the Pharisees? Like, he seems to come at the Pharisees. I wanted to say, okay, well, why is Jesus coming at the Pharisees like that? Like, they ask, are we blind too? You know, and he's like, well, now you're guilty. Not just blind, but guilty. So why is he coming at the Pharisees? Second, Jesus says, I came for judgment. And that caught me and we'll talk more about that. So the question is, did Jesus come in his first coming for judgment? Because we see some other scriptures where he says, I did not come for judgment. And so if you're a keen reader of the Bible, you'd say, wait a minute. I thought he didn't come to judge. Third question, Jesus says, I make the blind see. And we say, well, how does he make the blind see? I, I wanted to dig into that question a little bit. And finally, this is one that I think nobody ever touches. He says, I've made those who see blind. You don't think about Jesus going around striking people blind, right? Like we usually think of it the other way around, that he's, he's healing people. So what does Jesus mean by saying that he's going to make the seeing blind? So those will be our questions, and I'll, I'll kind of hit on them, all right? So uh, I hope by the end of this that we'll have answers to those four questions. Um, and one more question. It's not, the, it's not one of our guiding questions, but it's the title of the message. I also made it a question, and I, I stole it right from the Pharisees. And they ask, are we also blind? And, you know, obviously, they asked that question wrong. I won't say that they asked the wrong question, 
But they asked the question wrong, right? Because Jesus rebukes them in a sense for it. Uh, but I think it is a, a good way, a good question to ask ourselves. Maybe not the way that they ask it, but if we ask it sincerely, right? Now, I wear contact lenses. I mean, I am blind without my contact lenses. I, I, you know, I don't see very well. But, but that's not the kind of blindness we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we're going to be talking about what it means to be spiritually blind and what it means to see the truth that leads to salvation, all right? So to fill in context, if you remember, just before we got to these verses that we're at today, Jesus had healed a man born blind. And after he's healed the man himself, he says, never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. That's uh, John 9, 32. Now, eye problems, uh, infections that could lead to blindness, they were much more common in ancient days, even still today in, un, in less developed uh, parts of the world, right? If you consider something as, as simple as pink eye, right, conjunctivitis, we, we think of it, oh, you got pink eye, we know it's super contagious, kids stay home from school, right? And, and you get some antibiotics, and we kind of treat it offhand with antibiotics, and it, and it heals up, you know, in a couple days, you're good to go. But if you consider something as simple as that, before the advent of, of uh, antibiotics, these would, could fester and they could very easily lead a person to lose their vision or at least lose part of their vision, right? Um, it could be from infection. It could be from eye injury. I mean, think about, I started, I spent way too much time thinking about this, but you got these guys like chiseling stones, right? There's no OSHA. There's no, there's no safety glasses, right? A piece of that stone, ching, right? You gotta write something out, the daily newspaper that's chiseling it in stone, I don't know. It, it pops into their eye now. I mean, that could damage their eye. They could very easily lose their sight or something gets in their eye, which again, leads to infection and they lose part of their, their sight. So a loss of vision was, was actually much more common than we might think of it in, uh, in developed America, right? But this man's case was a little bit different. He was born blind. You know, and, and the scripture is insistent on that point, right? It really points out the fact that he was, he was born blind. In other words, this wasn't a condition that could clear up on its own. This wasn't a, a condition that, that medicine, even what little medicine they had, maybe some herbs or whatever they could, they could disinfect, witch hazel, I don't know. Probably shouldn't put witch hazel in your eye. Don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, whatever medicines they had, ointments, like it wasn't going to cure it, okay? It, the only um, fix for this man was a miracle, right? An event, you know, what is a miracle? It's an event that is entirely outside the ability of man to accomplish in the natural, right? And so we have to go beyond the natural today in looking at these scriptures because we need to see that, look, we're all in the same boat, actually, all right? The only help for us is a miracle. It is an event that is entirely outside of the ability of man to accomplish in the natural. And I hope that uh, by the end of this, we're going to see that the spiritual work that Jesus does is no less miraculous than the physical healing of this man. Amen? You know, so often I remember my early days, I said, well, if only I saw if only I saw some guy rise from the dead. If only I saw some guy who was blind. He's like, now I can see. And you could see that on YouTube, but most of the time I think it's fake. You know, uh, somebody, Benny Hinn whacking somebody with his jacket. And they're like, ah, you know, I, I, most of it's just, it's a show. Um, especially the leg lengthening one. You ever see that one on YouTube when somebody lengthens it? That, that, is a, that is crooked, okay? I've never, maybe there's one or two that are real, but... Todd White and those guys especially, it's, a, it's fake. They, they pull the shoe out, they push the shoe on. It is a scam. Um, not that God can't heal, but that, that stuff gets me really kind of bent out of shape, you know, when you see people so abusing. Um, but anyway. Um, all right, so to start, this man was literally blind, okay? The guy that we're looking at in the story, he was literally blind. He couldn't see. He was blind from birth, but Jesus uses the opportunity uh, of the blindness, he even says this, we looked at this two weeks ago, he uses the opportunity uh, of his blindness and the healing to reveal a spiritual truth, because that's what Jesus is after, right? We've talked about this before. If Jesus' mission on coming to earth was to heal people, well, that only happened for like three years out of all history. Like, I'd be pretty sorry that I didn't live during those three years, right? I mean, his reach was very limited, 
with what he could do in person in those three years. So it would make no sense for the primary objective of Jesus' coming to this earth to be physical healing for people. All right? Now, he can, of course, through the Spirit, heal people physically still, so there's that, but, but he, he is always pressing toward the heart, always pressing beyond to the spiritual healing. I think, I, I personally believe all the physical healings are really just kind of show, they, they show the spiritual healing that's available through Jesus Christ. So throughout scripture, Jesus uses the example specifically of blindness, uh, physical blindness to represent spiritual blindness. So that's the first big point, all right? If you take a notes, first big point is that physical blindness is a metaphor or a symbol for spiritual blindness. In fact, uh, sight in general, or even eyes, you look into like, I think it's Ezekiel, right? Where you've got all those things with the wheels and the eyes. And, you know, eyes in general are symbolic of insight or perception or discernment or vision or knowledge. They all kind of go together, right? It's all connected. It's the idea that you can, you can see accurately. Or in the case of blindness, you can't see accurately. I'll, I'll give you just a quick example that I think unlocks a lot when we, when we start thinking of this, about how the Bible uses this kind of symbolism. And uh, it's in Revelation chapter 5. In Revelation 5, if you remember, G John, he sees a vision of a scroll, and it's got seven seals. And there is none who are worthy to open and break the seals of this scroll. And John says he actually weeps. He laments. He's so sorrowful that there is nobody worthy to open this scroll that he weeps. But then it says this in, in Revelation 5, 6. It says, And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. All right, now, if you ever try to like maybe that's why they've never made a movie of Revelation. It's really hard, right, to, to visualize some of the stuff that they're, a lamb that looks like he's slain. Like, I don't know if you've really thought it through. Like, I always picture him standing on his back legs, like a lamb, like, eh, you know. Or is he on all fours? I don't know. Like, it's really hard to picture. And then the seven horns and seven eyes, like it looks like a spider, you know, kind of creepy. It's, it's a pretty wacky picture if you try to picture it literally. But so much of Revelation is not meant to be taken literally as symbolic. And, and when we start to understand that, obviously, the, the lamb with seven horns and seven eyes is Jesus Christ, right? Now, how do we know that? In the Gospel of John, we read that Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Several other places in Scripture, we make the connection between Jesus and the lamb, all right? Well, he's got seven horns. Well, seven is the number of completion or the number of perfection, right? Horns in the Bible represent strength, and power, okay? And eyes represent, as we said, insight and vision. So when we apply it and look at it that way, we see that here is Jesus Christ who is perfect in power and perfect in his insight or perfect in knowledge, in his vision, right? So that's the picture that we're looking at there. Jesus Christ, perfect in power, perfect in insight, perfect in discernment and knowledge, right? Now it makes a lot more sense when we start applying this kind of symbolic um, you know, understanding to the word. So anyway, just to say that eyes, vision, often symbolic uh, of what's going on spiritually. So Jesus is using that same kind of symbolism when he, when he basically tells the Pharisees that they're blind, right? He doesn't say that explicitly. He says it indirectly in the verses we're looking at today, but, but he is much more direct in other verses. He does literally say it. Uh, if you want to flip there, I'll be jumping around, but Matthew 23 Matthew 23, there's a section titled Seven Woes to the Scribes and Pharisees. I counted, there really are seven, so you don't have to count, all right? Uh, but Jesus gives a really pretty stern rebuke against the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the scribes there. I mean, it's a pretty, really, I think it's like a brutal dress down. It's one of my favorite portions. I say that about a lot of portions of scripture, right? But like, like I just, Jesus just he nails them there, you know? And um, he repeatedly says that they're blind. If you look at Matthew 23, 16, he calls them blind guides. In verse 17, he calls them blind fools. I wonder how he says it, like, is he, I don't know, I have a tone of voice, it doesn't tell us, but. In verse 19, he calls them blind men. In verse 24, he calls them blind guides. Again, in verse 26, he calls them a blind Pharisee. Jesus says, they clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence, and he says that they strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. But 
What's Jesus' real problem with their hypocrisy? You know, I wanted to, like I said, that first question, I wanted to dig a little bit deeper. What's his problem with their hypocrisy? And so if we stick with Matthew 23, he says in verse 4, he says, They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. He says in verse 13 to them, You shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. He says, you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. I mean, that is, that, that's, a, that's a hard word, right? I mean, I don't know, I, I think I would just ex like melt or evaporate if, if Jesus said that to me. In verse 15, he says, you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. And if we back up a little bit, Matthew 15, Jesus is again calling the Pharisees blind guides there in, in chapter 15. This time he says this, though, in Matthew 15, 14, he says, If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. So in looking at that first question, you know, what's Jesus' problem with the Pharisees? Okay, they're hypocrites. But why does that hypocrisy seem to bother Jesus so much? It's the fact that these men have been entrusted with leading men and women to God, but they have, they, they've been called as spiritual leaders over Israel to shepherd the flock of God's chosen people, but instead they have actually made it harder for people to come to God. And their question to Jesus really exposes their arrogance when they say, well, are we also blind? They're not asking sincerely, like I suggest we should. They're, they're asking haughtily, right, arrogantly, as if, as if they, the spiritual leaders of Israel, can't possibly be blind. But Jesus says, not only are you blind, but because you refuse to acknowledge your blindness, you're guilty as well. Your guilt remains. And, I, I, you know, in reading this, this is a, a warning to any, um, I, I had a whole bunch here, that I took out, but this is a warning to any who presume to teach the things of God, all right? Uh, whether it's from a pulpit, or whether it's just on the street, or it's one of those YouTube videos you are watching, or maybe making, I don't know. It's not a thing to be taken lightly. You know, Carl talked last week about the great privilege that it is to be able to share the Word of God, and it is true. I agree with Carl 100%. It is a privilege, but it is also, maybe more often, a terrifying responsibility. You know, and we can understand what we're really charged with. Um, because we are called to rightly divide the word, as Carl taught last week. And if we presume to be able to see, when in reality we're blind, then we heap guilt upon ourselves, right? And, and not only risk our own eternity as teachers, but risk the eternity of our listeners. 1 Timothy 4.16 Paul gives some advice to Timothy, which uh, is important for anyone that God's placed in a position of spiritual authority or as a spiritual leader. And quick time out, you don't have to be a pastor, you don't have to be an elder to be in a position of spiritual leadership, right? Think parents and their children, okay? Even boss and, and employees. Um, but Paul says this, he says to Timothy, take heed, now this is the New King James, some, some translations will say, hey, pay attention, all right? So pay attention to yourself and to your doctrine or your teaching. He says, continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. So it is important, Paul tells Timothy, pay attention to this stuff and continue rightly in it. So our first point, uh, based on that first question, is that we should honestly ask, I think that same question as the Pharisees ask, am I also blind? Am I also blind? But not out of an arrogant disbelief, but a sincere desire to know the truth so that we might better be able to lead others to the truth, right? Because part of our calling as Christians is to lead people to God, right? Only the Holy Spirit can change a person's heart, okay? We know that. We're not saving anybody. But our call is to lead others to God, and, and not just unbelievers to God, but also to hold one another accountable. And we need to know the Word of God and be able to rightly divide the Word of God in order to hold one another accountable. And so um, the Pharisees are condemned because they should be leading people to God, and instead they are blind guides leading those who follow into a pit. So that's Jesus' problem with the Pharisees. Um, their blindness would be pitiable if it wasn't that they were leading others into the same pit that they themselves are falling into.
And Jesus' love for those others causes him to rebuke those who are supposed to be the leaders and the guides. So hold on to that. Um, we're going to revisit that idea at the end, but I want to get to these other three questions. All right? And um, these other questions actually, I think, tie together in a sense. Um, they really lead one into the other. So I'll try to take them in turn, but you'll see how they actually uh, overlap a little bit. So we'll get into those. The second question has to do with Jesus and judgment. All right? Um, he starts this section here with an interesting statement. He says in verse 39, For judgment I came into this world. Well, what does that look like? Well, then he says, That those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. And again, that stopped me. I don't know if it, if it gives you pause, but it makes me wonder, you know, what does Jesus mean by saying that he came for judgment? Because if you remember back to John 3, we studied John 3, 17, it says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. Now, that word condemn uh, is actually judge in a lot of other English translations. It's the same et etymologically. They're connected, same root word as the word judgment when Jesus says, uh, I, for judgment I came into the world. So they're connected. So it could ease, it's a fine translation to translate it as judge. ESV translates it as condemn. But just the same, um, did he come to judge or did he not come to judge? Uh, again, John 12, 47, Jesus says, I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. And so, you know, before we get too much further, I, I love to deal with these apparent contradictions because I think they're really important. If we're, if we're unschooled in these, somebody could very easily trip us up. They're like, yeah, the Bible doesn't make any sense. They'll take us to two different verses and say, look, Jesus contradicts himself. And you'll be left there saying, oh, the Bible does contradict itself. I, I, I guess I'm wrong. You know, and so you really need to, I think, explore the complexities of that stuff um, because there's a lot of context around uh, single scriptures. We can't just take a look at two, cherry pick two. And uh, in, in studying this, you know, I found a quote by John Piper. He says it better than I do, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read his quote. He explains this apparent contradiction. So um, I think the answer also leads us into that third and fourth question there uh, of how J Jesus brings sight to the blind and how he makes those who are blind see. So here's what John Piper says. He's answering a question about the fact that Jesus seems to contradict himself. And he says, the contradiction is only apparent. It's not real. When Jesus says that he did not come to judge, he means that condemnation is not his first or his direct purpose. He is coming to save. When he says, for judgment I came into the world, he means that inevitably, as I save people by truth and love and righteousness, a division happens and rebellion is revealed and people are confirmed in their unbelief. And I'll, I'll back that up with scripture so you don't just have to take John Piper's word for it. But then he gives an illustration uh, that I liked. He says, it's like a doctor being called to amputate a man's arm because of a horrible infection in order to save his life. Just before the sick man goes under the anesthesia, he asks the doctor, did you come to cut off my arm? And the doctor answers, I didn't come to cut off your arm. I came to save your life. And we would all know what he meant, right? None of us would be like, ah, he's contradicting himself, you know? And I thought that was a great illustration because I think it really helps us understand uh, Jesus' mission in coming to the earth, which he says is to seek and save that which is lost. And it, it ties in actually perfect with, with what I just quoted out of chapter 3. Here's some scripture proof for you. John 3, 17 again. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world or to judge the world, if you want to translate it that way, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So there we see Jesus did not come to condemn the world. So how do I tie in this understanding that in his saving of the world, inevitably there is a condemnation? Bless you. Verse 18 is the very next verse right after that. John makes it clear. He says, whoever believes in him is not condemned. Came to save. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. Now this is within the same two verses. Okay, this is John writing, so there's, a, there's no contradiction. John said he didn't come to condemn the world. And then a verse later he says, but there are people who are condemned. All right? He says, whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So we see this idea that condemnation is really just the flip side of the coin right, of salvation. It has to inevitably. There is no neutral territory. Right? There is no neutral, you're, you're, you're neither. So, as those who are given to Christ by faith believe, those who do not are inevitably condemned. And, and that's what we see happening in the story of the man born blind. The Pharisees presume their salvation, don't they? They presume their salvation because of their works and because of their position as religious leaders. 
And Jesus says that their presumption only reveals the true nature of their blindness. He says, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. And I think that unlocks the answer for those last two questions. That's how we're to understand question three and four. How does Jesus make the blind see? How does he make the seeing blind? And, and we see again that there are two sides of the same coin. All right. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about Jesus making the blind see. All right. Because the picture of Jesus healing the blind, right? It, it, it's really, it's, it's rich in symbolism. It's, it's a beautiful image for, that you can apply spiritually. Right? Uh, it's, one of the, it's also one of the most obvious metaphors that we have, even in our English language, for enlightenment. Now, I'm not talking about like Eastern mysticism enlightenment. I just mean coming to the truth, all right? being enlightened. I mean, if somebody gets sudden knowledge or an idea in a cartoon, what happens? Bing, a light bulb, right? We have this, this very close connection in our language between light and illumination and being able to see things, right? We say things, we have, we have idioms. We say things like, uh, my eyes have been opened. To something. Maybe there was something that we didn't see before. Or we say a light bulb went off or went on. I guess it should be, right? It finally turned on. If, if we look into scripture, we see it again. Saul is blinded on the road to Damascus, right? And that blindness is a manifestation of his interior, his spiritual blindness, isn't it? And then when he's taken and, and, he, and Christ is revealed to him and he's commissioned by Christ and sees Christ for who he really is, what happens? Scales fall from his eyes and he sees. Okay, so we see that parallel. In speaking of coming to Christ, when we talk about uh, salvation experience, uh, I, I share it this way. It's the best way I can explain my salvation experience. I've shared it with you before. It literally felt like a veil was lifted off my eyes. It felt like suddenly like everything was obscured and suddenly things were clear. It felt like a veil was lifted. Um, and, I, and I share the experience how like, when I was in third grade, I got glasses. And I remember putting those glasses on in the back of mom's station wagon driving through Patchogue, right? And seeing a tree with leaves on it and being like, holy mackerel. I didn't know you were supposed to see leaves like that, you know? If you asked me a day earlier, I'd be like, no, I see fine. So I didn't know how blind I was until I could see, right? And so, um, in fact, when Jesus, the, the metaphor is so tied up with our idea of perception and understanding that it's actually hard to talk about it without employing uh, some metaphor of physical sight. So when Jesus says that he came so that those who do not see may see, even though there was a blind man who had, who had been healed, right? He says, I came so that those who do not see may see. Now, track with me here, okay? There's a guy who was blind right there in front of him. Even though that guy's literally there and very easily Jesus could be talking about physical healing, it was obvious that he was talking about more than physical healing, even though that guy was right there. How do I know that? Because the Pharisees say, are we blind also? They took it to the application. They took it to the metaphorical application right away, didn't they? They weren't saying, oh, I see fine. I could, you know. they, they knew that Jesus was talking about more than just the physical healing that had happened right there. That's why the Pharisees asked the question they too. So the question is, how does Jesus make the blind see? And well, the actual mechanism, if you want a mechanism, it's a mystery. It's a miracle. I don't have an answer for you on that one. I mean, he made mud to put on the blind man's eyes, right? But I suspect it wasn't really the mud, all right? If it was, I mean, we'd have a bunch of mud factories instead of eye doctors, right? It's, it's not the mud. There's something else going on there. And, and in the same way, you know, how Jesus opens our spiritual eyes, it, it's a mystery ultimately. So, so maybe the better question is, you know, what does it mean to see when we say that we can see? What does it mean when, uh, when we say that Jesus has made us see, or, and, and what do we see when Jesus opens our eyes? I think that's a question I want to take a look at. First John 5.20, jot that down because you'll want to look at this later. First John 5.20, I think it gives us a great answer to that. You know, what do we see when our eyes have been opened? And he says this in First John 5.20, he says, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. All right, he says, given us understanding, I'll substitute, has opened our eyes, okay? What has he illuminated us to? What has he opened our eyes to? He has given us understanding, here it is, so that we may know him who is true. That's our purpose. That's what, that's what he has brought us to see, so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true. In his son, Jesus Christ, he is the true God and eternal life. That is a dense 
verse. I think there's a lot we could kind of pull out of there. I'm going to pull some out here. He says, so, so when we come to see, what is it that we understand? We understand that truth is a person, right? Not just some abstract concept, and certainly not some subjective concept. Well, that's true for you, but you have a different truth, and you have a different truth. We talked about this at men's group on Thursday. We're like, that's, that's a stupid idea. Like, anybody says that to you, you should be like, that's stupid. You know, it doesn't even make sense. Uh, it, you, you think, they think it's an enlightened position that truth is subjective and relative to everybody. I'd say, that's idiotic. What else, what other period in time would somebody say that truth isn't an objective, factual, there's truth, there's an objective truth. But we think you're enlightened if you say that now. Um, so we understand, what do we see? We see that truth is a person. And it says that we are in him who is true. That's Jesus Christ he's talking about, who is truth. Is, it says, is the true God. There's a revelation for us. And there's some... Um, some sects or some cults, I'll call them, that pretend they're Christian, if they deny the deity of Christ, if they don't understand this truth that Christ is the true God, then they're, they're off. They're blind. And this idea that he is eternal life, it tells us in that verse. Not just holds eternal life and will hand it out to whoever he wants, but he is himself eternal life. It's helpful to think of like Christ as the ark that first, first Peter talks about, right? That those who are in the ark were saved, right? Those who are in Christ are saved on account of Christ being by the, by the right hand of God, right? So how do we come to know this, all right? Scripture tells us that it is an act of God. It's not something that we can do for ourselves. Just like we said at the beginning, the man born blind, he had no option other than stay blind or experience a miracle, right? Because we can't find God unless God first reveals himself to us. He's the one who does the revealing. If we look at John 1.18, the Gospel of John 1.18, John says, no one has ever seen God. And then he says this, the only God who is at the Father's side, all right, so there's a God who's at the Father's side. Either we're polytheistic or we have to understand the Trinity there, right? He says, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. So how is the Father known? God makes God known, right? Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27, I hope I'm not losing you. Jesus says this, he says, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, all right? And no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and, praise God for this part, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So we find that we can't know the Father unless the Son reveals him to us, right? Well, we ask, well, how does Jesus reveal the Father? All right, and I'll wrap up this section here with it. If having sight means that we know him, who is true, that is that we might know the Father, and it's Jesus who reveals the Father, I ask, well, how does Jesus show us the Father? Well, look at John 14. Philip says to Jesus, he says, show us the Father and it is enough for us. And Jesus says back to him, he says, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. You see how the, the Father points to the Son, the Son points to the Father, and they're all wrapped up there together. I love this. Um, to know the Father is to be in the Son, and it's all tied up together. Listen to, again, that, that verse in 1 John 5, 20, all right, with all this in mind. He says, We know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. And church, that mystery is deep. All right, deep enough to keep you busy the rest of your life. But it is simple enough that every person can know the truth, right? The heartbeat of this church, of Resurgence Church, is that we make a big deal about Jesus Christ, all right? We make a big deal about Jesus Christ because really it is all about Jesus Christ. I love what Carl preached last week just about the whole Levitical law being accomplished through Christ but manifested in his church, right? That everything is in Christ. I love that he, that he talked about um, all scripture being prophetic because we say, you know, you know, what percentage of the Bible is prophetic? All of it's prophetic. Well, how do I know? Because it all points to Jesus Christ, 
right? Revelation 19.10 says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So we know that prophecy comes when men are carried along by the spirit. That is the spirit of prophecy. It is the testimony concerning Jesus Christ. In other words, all prophetic utterances find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And the truth of it is that each of us are born blind. All of us have been born blind. But Jesus came, praise God, to make the blind see. And what do we see when, we do, when he does that? We see the truth of God's grace and forgiveness, and we even see God himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's the good news that we call the gospel. Right? We talk about the good news, that God has opened up a way to salvation through his son, Jesus Christ, and it's ours by grace through faith. And it is a miracle that we can't manufacture. It's a miracle that we can't imitate. It's a miracle that we can't fake. It is by his power that we are healed of our blindness. But listen, last point. That doesn't mean that we are entirely unaccountable for a lack of of faith or a lack of vision, all right? And like I said, that's the last point this morning. I want to I tie it up with this because some people have, I, I've had people say to me, all right, some people will say, well, if God is sovereign, all right, then it's not fair for him to punish me because obviously he didn't want me to be saved, right? And, and that's, their, that's their reasoning. In other words, they say, it's not my fault that I'm blind because God made me blind. Right? Well, God made this man born blind, blind, didn't he? He made him blind, but what was the purpose for it? We talked about it two weeks ago. Why did God make him blind? So that his works can be displayed in him. So that he could make him see. That man was born blind so that the power of Jesus Christ could be displayed and so that he could eventually see. He wasn't born blind. God didn't make him blind to stay blind. God made him blind that he might see. Right? And I believe, honestly, that the only reason Jesus would want someone to be blind is so that he could heal him. All right? It served as an opportunity for the works of God to be displayed in him. If that man born blind had said, it's not my fault that I'm blind because God may be blind, he'd be right. He'd be absolutely right. But God did it so that his power could be displayed in his healing. He didn't do it so that he could stay blind. In fact, the only one in this story who stays blind are the Pharisees who think that they don't need to be healed. And now look, I, I don't have God totally figured out. All right, I hope that doesn't discourage you. You're like, I'm out of here. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. All right, I don't have God totally figured out. I, no human mind can ever understand the sovereign prerogative of God and know everything of his purposes, right? All I can know is the revealed will of God, and he reveals it through his word, okay? And this is what he's revealed to us. First Timothy 2, 3 and 4, Paul says, This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So if somebody says, well, it's not my fault, God didn't want me to be saved, say no. First Timothy 2, 3, 4, God desires that all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Second Peter 3, 9, he says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So God's heart is for all men and women to find the truth and to come to salvation. And he has revealed, God has revealed enough of that truth. Romans says through creation, he's revealed enough of that truth. But through Jesus Christ as well, he has revealed enough of that truth so that he says that all men are without excuse. And in that sense, Jesus says he came for judgment. And not the final judgment of his second coming, but in revealing himself in human flesh, Jesus compels people everywhere to make a choice. He says, come to me and I will make you see. But instead, the Pharisees near him, they look at their phylacteries, those, those things that hold scripture that they would hold on their, their hands and their, their head. They look, at their, they look at their prayer shawls. Right? They look down at their seat seats. Those are the, the tassels that they hang from the four-cornered garment uh, that you see Orthodox Jews wearing today. They look at these things, these outward observances of their piety, and they say, clearly, he's not talking about us. Right? They say, we're not blind. Look at what we have done in obedience to his word. But listen, it is that very attitude that keeps them from seeing 
the salvation that Jesus offers. Because as long as they're looking at themselves about what we have done, their works that they have accomplished in order to save themselves, as, if, if, as long as their focus is there, they're never going to see the hand of God reaching out that wants to take them and set them on the rock that is Jesus Christ. And listen, church, it's still the same for us today. There will be a final judgment when Jesus returns. That will be his primary objective in his second coming. All right? He will come to judge the earth, but we live now, right here, in 2020, in that interim. Okay? We, we live when the revelation of Jesus Christ as the Son of God and as the only way to salvation has been publicly proclaimed. When the day of judgment has not yet come, but we are held accountable for what the light has revealed in Christ's first coming. And so to answer our last question, you know, how does Jesus make the seeing blind? I don't think he really goes around, like I said earlier, like zapping people, like striking people blind, all right? Uh, so much as he exposes the spiritual blindness of those who willfully reject his offer of sight and instead rely on their own physical sight, failing to acknowledge their true blindness. So, you know, I, I kind of, I know I went a little abstract, a little, a little theoretical maybe, uh, in some of the stuff theological today. So I, I wanted to kind of close it with, with something a little more practical. Say, all right, well, where, what do we do with this as believers? You know, what's the point? We're not just going to school why we come to church, right? We want, we want to hear truth that we can apply to our lives that are going to help us to live in the will of God. So you listen to me ramble for 30 minutes or so. You know, how, does the, how do we let this scripture shape our lives and conform us to the image of God's Son? Now, I'm speaking to those who confess Jesus Christ, to believers, all right? I believe that the application that we could take from studying the scripture is this. That first, we ought to acknowledge that there's nothing that we can do to fix our own blindness. All right? That's something we could walk away with. I could acknowledge I can't fix my own blindness. You know, just, to, just this week, before I got back to the word, I, I, I put a little conduit in the cry room. You could check it out later, all right? I put a little, so that the plug, the kids don't pull the plug and drop the speaker on their head, right? And, and I'm rushing, I cut it, and it's got that sticky stuff that you stick to the wall. It's just, you know, it's a little channel for the wire to run up. And so I do it, I stick it up there, and then I go to put the elbow on, I'm a half inch low. I had to level out and everything, and look at it, it's curved. All right, I probably try, you know what it's like trying to hold something with sticky on the back to a level, and it was impossible. So it hit the wall sooner than I meant to, and it, you know, it wasn't good. And I'm getting so frustrated, I get so frustrated about that sort of thing. I'm like, oh man, like, I just, it was so easy. I just wanted to get it done quick, and then I could get back to working on the sermon. And, and, and I, so I do this thing, and then I'm like, oh, I'm gonna peel it off the wall. And that was a huge mistake. Because then the paper, the sheetrock paper, rips off, and now I'm like, oh, I'm, a, I'm a painter. I know I can paint it, but you still see it. It's just all the same color. You can't rip paper off the wall and just paint it. It doesn't cover it. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't change the, maybe it's a millimeter, but you still see it. So I'm like, oh my God, okay, maybe I'll put it down here. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm freaking out. And, and I, I kind of, I just painted it and left it. And I'm like, Lord, I can't even do that right. You know, and, and I'm like, I can sit here and be really bent out of shape which I'm good at doing, you know, letting that kind of thing really bother me. Or I said, you know what, Lord? I'm going to let that serve every time that I see that because that's the kind of thing I'll see it every day. And I'll be like, oh, gosh. Every time I walk in that room, now every time you walk in that room, you're going to be like, this fool. You can't even put a sticky thing on the wall. I started peeling the big one off. I started pulling more paper, and I was, just, I was sweating, literally sweating. But I said, Lord, I'm going to, every time I look at that thing, I'm going to tell myself that your grace is so much more sufficient, that your grace covers over my weakness, that your grace covers over my inabilities, because I can't even do this right. I can't save myself. I can't be righteous enough. I can't put the stupid thing on the wall. And I'm, so I'm going to, every time I look at that, I made a vow to the Lord. I said, I'm going to remind myself every time I see that that is going to be a standing testimony of your grace to me. Stupid, I know, but hey, you know what? It's better than getting bent out of shape about a stupid piece of plastic, right? So first thing we need to do, I said application, we acknowledge, acknowledge that there's nothing we could do to fix our blindness, right? Then we ought to, second, we ought to rejoice, right? That is a, that is a call that we rejoice in all circumstances. We rejoice in the work that Jesus did by giving us spiritual sight. If you're saved, you say, thank you, Lord. Live in that. You say, well, that's not real practical. Yes, it is. Try it for a day to remind yourself to rejoice because of what Jesus has accomplished for you. See how it doesn't change your life. And finally, we ought to magnify him. 
All right, we ought to magnify him as the one about whom all scripture testifies and as the one who shows us God the Father. How can we know God the Father? We look at Jesus Christ. You know, but maybe some of you are still saying, well, that's not practical enough. All right, uh, that doesn't tell me what to do in the day to day, but I really do believe that having these right mindsets, they really are uh, practical. It really is very practical, but I'll give you one quick example, okay? Uh, you might say, that's great advice, so how do I apply it to my life when, for example, schools are closed and the kids are really being a pain in the neck, okay? Not that I have that experience, but the kids are always a pain in the neck because we homeschool. So, you know, what do we do when the schools are closed, the kids are home and they're, and they're, and they're giving me a hard time? Well, here's how I would apply it, all right? First, we recognize that they're sinners. We're good at that part. But recognize that they're sinners like we are, that we're sinners too. Recognize that we are parenting the old man, the unregenerated man, right, in most cases. And God has called us to be their guides. And so we need to be sure that we are going to the source so that we can see clearly so that we don't lead them into a pit. And that, look, when you start thinking about that, if your kid's giving you a hard time and you realize God has made me a spiritual guide to these young people and I can't lead them into a pit. I need to go to the source so that I can see clearly, so that I can lead them clearly. When you do that, you know what it happens? It enables us to have compassion instead of just being angry. And it allows us to pray for them rather than just yell at them. It enables us to lead them with grace instead of driving them with the law. And so just one quick example as I was thinking about how we apply right thinking to the practical struggles that we face. But listen, to the unbeliever, all right, that was speaking to the believer. To the unbeliever, there is a warning here as well. Jesus says, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But the fact is that you are blind, all right? And we all were at one point. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he says, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. But the Pharisees, they mistook their natural sight for spiritual sight. And so Jesus says their guilt remains. And if you're here, you've never recognized your own blindness before or your need for Jesus Christ and never considered that the God of this world has blinded you, then I pray that you would recognize that today, that you would call out to Jesus and acknowledge to him that you are blind and ask him to open your eyes to the truth of who he is. I, I think the prayer could be as simple as that. God, show me. You, you want me? Show me who you are. And then look. And if you've never done that and you would like for me or one of the elders to pray with you, I would be privileged to do that after service. But for now, um, let's just all bow our heads. Let's thank God for his word and for his mercy. Amen. Father, I thank you that your word is alive, that it speaks to us. I thank you, Lord, that though we were blind, you came to make us see. I pray, Lord, that we would humble ourselves before you, acknowledging our own blindness, knowing that there is only one option, Lord, that we cannot heal our own blindness, but that you are the one, if you will, Lord, you will touch us and, and make us to see. I pray that you would open up more and more eyes, Lord, even as the days grow shorter, that you would open up eyes, that your, your kingdom would be filled with sons and daughters. Give us the words to speak, Lord, in every situation. Let us be ready with a reason for the hope that we have when, when we're asked. Let us, be, let us manifest, not fake it, but let us manifest the joy that is ours in Christ. I pray for your people, Lord, for this body, that you would continue to build them. Even as we go to two services, Lord, part of our heart was that we don't want to divide the body, that we uh, want to maintain fellowship. I pray, Lord, that you would do it supernaturally, that, that you would keep people calling each other, texting each other, Lord. Um, maybe swapping which service they're at, Lord, just ways to, to keep everybody connected, that, that this body would be united and that we would be of one mind, one heart, Lord, baptized into one body that is Jesus Christ as the head. So we love you. I thank you for this service. Pray that it has been honoring to you. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.